What's up guys, Headphones Neil here with a very special episode of Headphones Neil Reviews in the form of an Amusement Park double feature review. So I will be reviewing and recapping um, the two days that I spent in the Southern California theme parks. So let's jump right into it. A B N. It's Headphones Neil! So the first theme park that I visited with the group was on August 13th at Knott's Berry Farm in Biona Park, California. So the general idea behind the day was to visit the theme park, check out their 100th year anniversary celebrations, decorations, go on some rides, take some foods, and if there was time permitting, maybe check out some shows. So. I will get the simple thing right out of the way right off the bat where we did not get a chance to view any of the shows, but we were able to accomplish everything else. So we started the day with a walkthrough of the park. So we started in Ghost Town, which was or and still is probably my favorite area of the park. So up until around the time Ghost Rider opened, I would visit the park pretty regularly and then I had a chance to go a couple of years ago to um, visit the park and I was able to go on um, one of two of their new rides, um, Hang Time, but we were unable to go at the time on Accelerator just because the lines were long. Um, so Ghost Town remains my favorite area just because it's probably the most um, hashed out um, and thought through area of the park because you get a full on um, Old West style town. So you have things like the mayor's mansion, a hotel, the mayor himself, uh, stables, jails, graveyard, um, and various other um, stores and shops and even a saloon that you would see in an Old West town. So when you're walking through the area, you feel like you are actually in an Old West town. So overall, the area is generally just a fun and interesting place to visit. And then with the addition of Ghost Rider around 2001, you now have an extra roller coaster to go on. Um, so I want to say since then, they did add a road ride called Pony Express, and then they rebranded Bigfoot Rapids to Calico River Rapids to kind of uh, normalize and, love, and even out the th um, theme of the Old West Town and the naming conventions and the things you see in the area. So... Walking through the town is a very good look and feel. In general, it hasn't, I don't want to really say that it's changed too much. They might have updated some of the look and feel of certain areas, uh, moved stuff around, updated stuff over the years, kind of like small updates. But in general, the look and feel of the area is very well done. So when you're walking through it, just think of an Old West town that you might see in a movie. Um, not necessarily with all the bandits going around, but generally just a calm, peaceful Old West Town, and that's what you have at, or have in Ghost Town in uh, Knott's Berry Farm. Um, uh, moving on from there, we went on over to the Boardwalk, which is said to be themed around, uh, Southern California, um, beach town, um, uh, set around the time of the Roaring Twenties. So when you are um, visiting the town, you um, do get to um, you get you know a waterfall, the um, hotel, the storefronts, and general idea that you see here match the Roaring Twenty. So um, it's not necessarily the most um, detailed thing, but it's very simple and matching of its. Um, comparison to a Southern California beach town. So the best comparison would probably be like the Santa Monica Pier with the roller coaster on uh, roller coaster rides and other carnival style features right on the beach. So you do have you know a small pier. You have a ride in the form of hang time, which is to like which is an homage to the beach and surf culture. Um, it re it replaced my favorite ride up in which was there until I want to say 2016 or 17, in the form of Boomerang. But Hang Time fits the theme of the um, area a lot more. And then you have a um, 
um, ride that replaced an old boat ride called uh, Coast Rider, which is kind of a back and forth style roller coaster that goes up and down. So nothing too extravagant, but like I said, if you if you've ever been to Santa Monica Pier or if you've seen it in movies and things like that, then you kind of know the look and feel of that coaster. And then you have, you know, a spinning tumbler style ride. Um, you have arcade and various other prize games where you can, you know, shoot hoops to win prizes, um, throw stuff at ducks and things like that. So th various uh, small games to win prizes, kind of like you see in a carnival um, or a street fair kind of thing. So as far as that sort of theming goes, that's kind of what you expect from Boardwalk. So it's probably the smaller of the um, area of the three big areas. Um, there is four in the form of Camp Snoopy, but I'll get to that in a little bit. Um, and then we moved on over to board or to the Fiesta Village, which is a themed area around the Latin American culture to pay homage to the, their culture in Southern California. So, you know, with the rides like named Montezuma's Revenge and Jaguar, you kind of you get that tie in. And then um, the various other smaller rides like the Mexican Hat Dance and the um, Carnival and arcade games in this area are all themed around a vibrant, rich um, culture um, around the Latin American culture. So in general, just a fun area and you get, while you do have uh, Montezuma's Revenge and Jaguar, you have a lot more of the smaller rides like the uh, fair, the merry-go-round and um, the Mexican hat dance and the swings and things like that. So generally just a fun atmospheric area and then the food and um, shows and things like that are themed around the culture as well. So um, that was the bulk of our trip around the park. Uh, we didn't spend too much time in, or we didn't spend time in Camp Snoopy just because we didn't have any kids in the group. But if you do have kids, then you, um, Camp Snoopy is a place to go. You do have a lot smaller versions of rides you see in the park, and rides generally built for kids. So um, there's that, and then you have you can have spend time with the various Peanuts characters who are around um, to check that out. Um, there is a small area with a drawbridge and a and waterfalls, so you can walk behind the waterfall, go on the drawbridge and check that out, and then you have a small little stream as well. So a nice little park style area, which is a nice little touch, and I thought it was one of two of the most beautiful parts of the park. The other part was near um, the Calico River Rapids where they have another waterfall and a small pond or lake with some fish in it. So. Um, definitely small areas to check out if you want just waterfalls to relax next to. So from there we uh, moved on over to the um, um, riding on some roller coasters which we didn't have any particular plan to go in any specific order but since we were in um, the Fiesta Village area and right next to Silver Bullet we started with that one and um, we were originally going to plan on going, you know, from uh, smallest to largest, but since we were there we've, and the line was short, we decided to give that one um, first billing and overall a very fun ride. Um, you do have the loop and various curves and twists and turns and all of that. And a pretty fast ride, so it does live up to the name of Silver Bullet. Um, we, since we were still in the um, Fiesta Village area, we moved on, to, moved on over to Montezuma's Revenge and uh, Jaguar. So Mana's Room is Revenge is a fast ride and pretty slow or pretty short as far as time goes but a good um, ride as far as moving on from Silver Bullet and then Jaguar is kind of a mix between Silver Bullet as far as the ups and downs and turns go but kind of rickety as far as a ride kind of like a wooden coaster so the i guess it's supposed to mimic um a jaguar running up and down on hills and his general form of running so a fun ride um and not necessarily a smooth ride but still fun because you get an overview of fiesta village um then we moved back on over to ghost or to the ghost town and we rode on ghost rider so a uh, ride that we found a lot faster than we remember just because it feels like either they did some uh, retrofitting to the cars or maybe to the track where it was still rickety but it felt a lot faster than we remember so granted it's you know memories like especially for me from 
almost 20 years ago so maybe it's age or maybe my memory faded as far as how fast the ride is but in general it was a fun ride to go on and one of two of my favorite rides the other being silver bullet um and then since we were in ghost town we decided to go on back to pony express it's a sh really short ride um it kind of mimics or merges what we see on mana's Ruins revenge and jaguar where you're um propelled forward and then you have a couple of ups and downs and twists and turns it's a pretty short ride, I want to say probably almost as long as Montezuma's Revenge, but basically you're um, on a horse, you're tilting forward as if you're riding on a pony or a horse, and um, you're going over a couple of curves. Um, I like this one a little bit just because you have a chance to go over Calico River Rapids and you get an overview of that, so a nice little touch there where they use some of the open area of the Calico River Rapids. Um, and then we rounded out the rides on Accelerator. Um, we didn't necessarily keep this one last on purpose, but since we were kind of walking in a circular form, it ended up being last. But this actually turned out to me be my favorite new ride of the day just because it catapults you forward. You go on to the top of a steep hill and you go on a drop that's nearly vertical. So very scary, good, fast turns and a really short ride. So think of Montezuma's Revenge on steroids, um, so definitely a ride to wor or worth going on. If I had a chance to go on Hang Time again, it would be a matter of comparing the two. Um, I want to say Mon Hang Time is also a good fun ride and probably, as far as uh, I'm concerned, my favorite of the two, but because it's been a few years since I've had a chance to go on Hang Time, it's kind of hard to compare a ride that I've just been on. So something to um keep in mind there um so from there we also we did ha go on some of the other more relaxing rides so we did go on the calico mine ride to get out of the heat a little bit um overall it didn't feel like they changed the ride too much what to the point where um um, I didn't remember anything different, so it is a relatively dark ride. Um, so they're taking you as if you are going in a dark mine, so they have colors and smoke patterns and uh, minor animatronics and things like that. So a good slow ride to go on and pretty fun, nothing too crazy. So if you want to get out of the sun like it's a particularly hot day, you want to relax and sit for a little bit, or if you have kids in your group, then de it's definitely a... Um, nice ride to go through just to have uh, a little bit of downtime and that's also why we went on the calico railroad after that where we kind of wanted to still get out of the sun uh, sit a little bit after lunch and um, take a trip around the park so that's where calico railroad really shines is that you do get to see various parts of the park from kind of like the back lot so you do see the backs of buildings you see some of the uh, different um tents and stuff that, that are going up and thing for like not scary farm so pretty relaxing there and i still did and i still like that they keep the hold up routine going so you have a couple of bandits get on the train and act like they're sticking you up um i don't remember them doing a comedy routine so it feels like that's something new that they're doing um, maybe for the 100th anniversary celebration or they change the narr narrative a little bit so um, in general, I do recommend get, uh, going on the train a little bit. If you don't go on the Calico Mine Ride, the railroad is a is another way to go to um, sit in the shade of the train and go around the park. It's about a 10 minute ride, so you do get a that much of a break, like 10 to 12 minutes. You get that much of a break out of the sun and from walking. And then we rounded out the rides of the day by going on Berry Tales. It's the 4D ride that, um, so I forget what the ride was that they replaced ride the dinosaurs ride with, but it's at the back of the park when you're um, leaving or if you're if you're near the bumper cars and you're heading towards hang time, then you'll see the Berry Tales ride on the left. So they basically made a um, game adventure where you're shooting um, these rodents that are stealing some pies. So the best comparison I want to say is the um, Ast I think it's called Astro Blasters at Disneyland. So if you've ridden on that ride, then 
Um, Berry Tales is a very similar ride to that. So they've themed the ride around um, the boysenberry theme uh, and purple theme of the park. So you do hold a gun in the form of a boysenberry or a can of, or bottle of boysenberry jam and you use a uh, rope in the back to fire the gun so i thought that was a nice touch the ride is filled with the smell of boysenberry so another fine touch and then you shoot the animals and you try to get as high of a score as possible so that was probably the most relaxing or not relaxing but most fun we had just because it, it became a little bit of a competition to see who could get the highest score but in general, it was a um, good time and a good way to round out the day that we spent at the park, just to have a little bit of fun. Um, it's another ride that's covered up and in relative darkness, except for the screens and in air conditioning. So the biggest um, upside there. So as far as the general treats and food that we had th um, throughout the day, um, everyone had a little bit of different stuff. So for me, I'm going to cover the snacks that I had. So I started off with the boysenberry filled churro. Um, so it's a bit of um, personal touch. I when Anytime I go to an amusement park, I have to have a churro. I really like the taste and smell and overall flavor of them. So every time I go, I have to have one. And since Knott's Berry Farm was having a limited time offer of a boysenberry filled churro, I decided to give it a shot. And in general, I thought it was pretty tasty. It's kind of like, it was basically filling the churro with boysenberry jam, I wanna say, or jelly. So in general, very good there. Um, in the early afternoon, right around lunchtime, we did head on over to the saloon um, to relax a little bit. This was, um, I wanna say after Pony Express, before Accelerator, before we went on the mine ride and the railroad and all of that. Um, and I decided to, so they have a couple of different boysenberry beers. So they have one in the form of a draft beer and one in the form of a pale ale. Um, so we all got different things, but I ended up getting the boysenberry draft beer and it was pretty tasty and flavorful. I don't really know my beers. Um, so it was kind of like a beer with a hint of boysenberry. So uh, pretty refreshing. It was nicely chilled and cool. So a good taste on the palate. And the final bit of snack that I had was the boysenberry soft serve and probably my favorite of the day just because it had the most boysenberry taste to it. It was nice and cool and it was good to have in the almost 90 degree temperature of the um, day. So um, if I was to recommend a treat while they have the boysenberry themed food and snack, uh, snacks, I would recommend the boysenberry soft serve. Um, the other two are not to say that the other two are bad in any particular way. It's a matter of taste and palate. So for example, if you're there all day and you have a chance to try all three, it's not that any one is or two are better than the others. Just for me, I was able to taste the boysenberry the most in the soft serve. So that's kind of why I liked it the most. Um, so for me, it's like if you're labeling something with a particular flavor, if you can't taste the flavor, it's hard to judge it. And that's kind of where I went with that. With that. Um, so to round out the day and to um, give my favorite parts of the day are the random little touches that they have going on in the park. So um, in the for this particular instance, there are two random finds that I wanted to share. So I want to say while up until they have Not Scary Farm uh, for 2021, there is a very special um, gravestone in um, the graveyard that they have that's out in Ghost Town. So when you're in one of the um, um, shop lines of shops, I think it's right past the. Um, food stand where they have the grill, the barbecue chicken before the um, haunted jail cell, I think it's called. Um, there's a, real, a small plot of land with some grave markers, which in general have all been there, but they added one for a not scary farm character for RR Crossing. So I thought that was a nice touch. He has one of the bigger grave marker, gravestone markers, so definitely worth checking out if you're. Um, interested in checking that area out. Um, there is also a grave where if you step on the grave then there's a heartbeat. So like it does a little um, thump thump bump bump kind of thing. Uh, we did try stepping on it to see if um, 
it would have worked and it didn't so I don't know if they took that out it wasn't working maybe they hadn't turned on that particular motivation that particular uh, feature of the graveyard or maybe um, it's a totally random thing that happens you know periodically throughout the day so I was kind of bummed that that didn't happen for any of us but um, it's one of those things that's worth checking out that if you don't know about then you're gonna miss it but if you do it's always a fun little feature that they have in ghost town and then as far as the other random find which i didn't know about but i was wa i did learn about when i was uh, watching some videos online is that in the boardwalk roaring 20s area when you're going from the bumper cars towards the berry tails ride there's a random unassuming door that you wouldn't think to um, do anything with you would just think it's you know a door to the building but it is actually secretly a speakeasy so you'll see so when you're heading towards berry tails from the bumper cars on the right you'll see a door with a sign that says blind tiger so when you ring the doorbell you'll or when you go by that door you'll hear music playing so when you ring the doorbell you'll hear people inside randomly talking at looking for a shipment and so you can ring you can push the um, buzzer multiple times and you'll get a different answer each time and at some random point it's going to ask for the secret password um, and I want to say that they did a good job and it has a very nice touch as far as not necessarily having the same response to every to any time you have an interaction so I rang the buzzer once and it said asked for they asked for the password so I knocked on the door three times and it said okay you can come in this guy's legit but then I did it again and I knocked three times and it said we don't know who you are go away so I thought that was pretty funny and nifty so um, when you're checking out the uh, videos on the YouTube playlist, I do have the interaction there. Um, I didn't catch all of it because I was trying to, you know, hold a phone and record and push a buzzer. So I did a brief snippet of it, but we got a kick out of that and it is definitely a nice touch. So I thought I would share that. Um, so if you guys have a chance to check that out at the park, then definitely swing by that way. And there were other people, other guests in the park who didn't know about that and uh, we were able to help then get a kick out of that as well. So that is all for the trip to Knott's on August 13th. So with that, I'm going to jump into a recap of the trip at Disneyland, um, which is going to be briefer, but it's going to be um, notably about a couple of, or basically two parts of the park. So um, on August 14th, I had a chance to visit Disneyland with a friend. Um, we wanted to, or the main purpose of the trip originally was just to go to Galaxy's Edge and check out Star Wars Land and go on the rides, uh, visit the area, just ha hang out and have a good time. Um, and then visit the park later in the day um, based on when we finish Galaxy's Edge. Um, so we had to flip that around a little bit because um, Rise of the Resistance in Galaxy's Edge does have a virtual queuing system so you have to sign in or you have to open the app right at 7 and to try and get a boarding pass so we both tried that and it was already full and we tried a couple of times for like half an hour and we couldn't get it get the boarding pass so we tried again at noon which is the sec other time you can get the boarding pass and we were able to get it for the afternoon so we ended up doing the going around the rest of the park getting all the other rides done and then visiting galaxy's edge after lunch and it was actually a relatively chill and quiet day at the park, so we, ever, we were able to actually get on all the other rides pretty quickly. So by lunch, we were able to get through um, Indiana Jones, Space Mountain, Star Tours, Jungle Cruise, Pirates of the Caribbean, and the Haunted Mansion. So um, that and that tells you like if you can get through all of those in half a day, that tells you how quiet and short the lines are. I think the longest wait time we had was maybe 35 minutes, so that was pretty good for us, and that gave us more time to spend in Galaxy's Edge in the afternoon. And then we even had a chance to go on the pirate ship around, um, I think it's Mark Twain Island or the Huckleberry Island, whatever that island is called, at the back of the park next to. Um, Splash Mountain and then um, we were able to go on um, It's a Small World. We didn't really want to duplicate any or actually we did duplicate one ride but I'll get to that uh, when I get there. Um, so I wanted to start this particular review with the Jungle Cruise ride experience because 
partly because of the movie um so i have an idea of what going into the movie what to expect but also because i've never been on the ride in all the times i've been to disneyland so i was telling my friend like hey let's go check it out go on the ride see what it's all about because of the movie and i've never been on it um my friend i think he said has been on or had been on it once or twice so um we're like okay well let's go on and see what changes and retrofits they made and otherwise i'm um, just see what it's all about so overall it was a good ride i liked the, our boat captain he was full of uh puns it was one right after another for the whole trip so i got a kick out of that um so if you've never been on it that or um if you don't remember that many puns being on the ride i would definitely recommend um, giving the ride a shot just to um check and hopefully get a ca boat captain that does have a lot of puns um the video on for the jungle cruise on the playlist youtube playlist will have a example of that so um our captain our boat captain definitely made the ride that much more enjoyable so um i recommend going on the ride and that's really all there is to say about it i mean it was a good experience good for my first time and i think i kind of want to go on the ride again in the future um there's no reason not to um especially if you're in that area and the wait time is good so and it makes it easy because you know it's right next to indiana jones so you can plan out the, those two rides pretty easily and then of course since you're next to pirates of the caribbean um haunted mansion and splash mountain it's basically one ride right after another um in succession so if you're in that area it's easy to get all of those rides out of the way really quickly so from there um basically once we had finished out all the rides um so after lunch we headed over to galaxy's edge because we had just got our boarding passes and it was like a three hour wait for the ride we decided to check out everything else so we of course had to drink the blue milk which um i got a kick out of um it's like a concoction of like a coconut milk and a few other things but um if you were to ask me what it tasted like it was more like a sl ice slushy or a slurpy um or like a blueberry slurpee kind of thing so it's, it has blue flavoring it was very icy and good and it tasted very good in the early afternoon when it was getting to be above 80 degrees so whatever they actually put in there it actually really only it basically comes down to uh um blueberry icy so as far as it being blue milk as far as i know it doesn't actually contain any any blue or any milk or anything that would tell you that why it's color blue but they did a very good job of um making it that right color to match what we see in a new hope and um the last jedi and then we were gonna get you know some of the other food in the area but we walked around the area checked out the shops and um the wraps were okay but we didn't really feel the options were okay so it's like a pork option and a vegetarian option but it didn't really strike our fancy of um food we wanted to eat so um we generally checked out the area and i want to say that of all the area themed areas in disneyland galaxy's edge is my favorite mostly because of course it is star wars but it's the most well themed area of the park so from the trash can to the signs to the lampposts the sound effects um and in general just the whole area themed area is as if you are in a star wars planet so overall a very um good area to um visit if you're a star wars fan or you want to see a it, like when disney goes all out in theming area this is a good example of what it looks what they can do with all their um experience um employees and staff and imagineers and abilities and money and all of that so this is a very well done area themed area so black spire outpost makes you feel like you're in another outpost like you know moss eisley or um moss espa or any of the other um uh, area like any of those other outposts like even like uh, Maz's castle so things like that so any of those outposts you see in star wars it's as if you're in one of those um and then when you get to for example smugglers run and seeing a life-size millennium Fal falcon which i guess some side guy was saying that it's only like half scale but even then 
when you see the a full size Millennium Falcon that rises up above you, it's a full on nerd out moment because you know growing up with it, you only you've only you know we've only seen the Millennium Falcon on the big screen in theaters on TV and things and in um, select video games, but seeing it in person, you get to see a ship that everyone really loves and you know the biggest the fastest hunk of junk in the planet is a very fun thing and a good to, thing to see and then being able to go on it via the smugglers run ride you are taken to another level of fandom and nerdiness because you get to walk around the um ship as and see various iconic aspects of the ship like the chessboard that um Chewie and C-3PO and R2-D2 are playing at. You see the doorway that Han and Chewie come in through um, from in um, The Force Awakens. And then when you get on the actual ride, ride and you're in the cockpit, um, that's all very well done. So all in all, a very well done ship design as far as seeing it from the outside. And then also when you're inside and on the ride, it, um, it's one of those things that you don't know what to expect like you know it's like okay well i'm gonna see the ship and i'm gonna see the inside i've seen that in the movies but when you're there you get a certain sense of nerdiness and joy from seeing that in person because now you get to say i'm on the millennium falcon i'm inside the ship i get to see the cockpit and the chessboard and the various insides i get to see it from the outside and look up at it rather than looking at it on tv or on your computer screen so Definitely a, a good ride to go on and a good area to check out. Which brings us to Rise of the Resistance, which I'm not going to spoil it for anybody if you haven't had a chance to go on the ride yet. But Rise of the Resistance takes Smuggler's Run to a whole nother level to the form of you um, go. So basically, I went into the ride spoiler free. I didn't know what to expect, I didn't know what kind of oh, how the ride was going to be. Or anything like that so when you're in the queue the waiting line to queue up for the ride even that doesn't give you any indication of what is gonna be what's gonna happen on the ride so I mean from the name of the ride it's rise of the resistance so you know it's gonna it's set in the sequels you're going to have something dealing with the resistance and the first order so by the time you get in the ride um, you have that interaction, you have, um, you're basically signed up for a mission. It's kind of like Smuggler's Run, where you have a smuggler show up to give you, to have you, um, smuggle a shipment of coaxium, whereas Rise of the Resistance, you're being enlisted into the ranks of the Resistance. So, I kn knew it was going to be a good ride, because, right from the start, because what, they take you to the first pre-boarding area and you get to see a very iconic x-wing so i thought like okay that's cool so um going from there they load you into the um mission briefing room to get signed up for the resistance and the hologram that they used was a very cool trick to the point where i don't know how they did that so i was very close to the hologram so the hologram just shows up and I was like, okay, that's cool. How do they do that? And unfortunately, we couldn't get on the ride again. So I don't know if they allow you, you uh, riders to go on the ride only once a day for now. So that um, people can, or as many um, attendees to the park can go on it. Or because of the virtual queuing system and the length of the ride, which was another thing I didn't expect. Um... It's one of those things where we didn't get the chance to go again. So if the next time I have a chance to go to the park, which I don't know when that's going to be, I want to go on Rise of the Resistance again, just so I can try and look at that hologram from a distance to see, try and figure out what I did, which is contra counter to what they want um, guests to do is they want it to look like a seamless thing. That's just a natural everyday um, holographic function. But I thought that was particularly cool. And then they board you onto a ship, which they went all out on. So, of course, I mean, because it's an amusement park, it's going to have that natural, you know, plasticky, shiny look to it, which is on all the rides. You know, it's whether it's, you know, Haunted Mansion or Indiana Jones or Jungle Cruise or Star Tours or anything like that. But the design of it was so well done. It's like you were actually on a... Star Wars villain ship and 
you were actually there. So like think of like the Death Star and you know what the yellow lights or the not the yellow lights, but the white lights in the oval form on the walls of the Death Star. That's there. Um, when you're looking up and down the hallway, you it's easy to forget that you're in Disneyland and you're at a theme park. It's as if you are on a Star Wars vehicle. So much like the Millennium Falcon and being in the cockpit and in the various features of the cargo hold, Rise of the Resistance does the same thing. Uh, and and no, we're still in the pre, um, pre-boarding of the ride. We actually haven't gotten on the ride yet. So it's overall a very, very good ride. Um, as far as a good themed experience that they have presented. So definitely worth the wait. And then you get on the ride and you're in a full on battle between the resistance and the first order. And the steps that they take you through are very good to the point where, um, you're, the interactions are very well done. The puppetry is great. The voice acting is great. Um, it makes you feel like you're in a, they make you feel at one point where as if you're in a space battle and you're actually going through a ship. So, um, I liked all of that and I'm bummed that I couldn't go on it twice, but it's one of those things where another trip to the park will solve that. Um, and that, and I want to say the ride is kind of, a mix of, think of it like a mix between Star Tours and Indiana Jones. So the actual vehicle that you're in is kind of like Indiana Jones where they jerk you all around a lot, but it's kind of like Star Tours where they're giving you a storied experience while you're in those cars. So they, you know, they're jerking you back and forth and up and down and a little bit of Tower of Terror mixed in there. So, um, in, I, or I guess a, a better example would be maybe, um, Smuggler's Run and when you're on the Millennium Falcon going back and forth and up and down and all of that. So. It's a very, very interactive ride and worth the wait. So at least in the Anaheim version of, or the Anaheim part uh, for Disneyland, the ride didn't open with the Smuggler's Run. So it was definitely worth that extra wait. And I can see why it took them that extra time to get it set up because it is a more immersive experience than Smuggler's Run. So um, my recommendation when visiting Galaxy's Edge is to go on um, Smuggler's Run first so you get that experience then go on Rise of the Resistance because for me they were both good rides in their own way but if you go on Rise of the Resistance first and then Smuggler's Run um, I have the feeling that you're like if you're not as big of a Star Wars fan or um, you really like you go on Rise of the Resistance and then you're expecting the same thing for, or a similar thing from Smuggler's Run you're gonna be super bummed that at what Smuggler's Run offers and not to say that it's better or worse, I did like them both very well for their own reasons because Smuggler's Run, you're on a ship and running a mission versus Rise of the Resistance is more expansive and you're um, jolted into the middle of a story. So it's like they took um, Star Tours and they ramped it up to like 5,000 per, they ramped it up 5,000%. So if you do those two and then you go to Star Tours, you're going to definitely be bummed out. So and. So I would recommend not even going on Star Tours because of these two rides. They're a more immersive experience. They're more fun. Um, they're, and they're basically more of a Star Wars experience than Star Tours. Star Tours is kind of like the light version of both rides. So it's like if, you, if you're building up or you're waiting to go into Galaxy's Edge, start off with Star Tours, then go to Smuggler's Run, then Rise of the Resistance. So you're building up from the like a summary of what Star Wars is to more of what Star Wars is to the uh, full on full body experience. So overall, it was a good experience. I nerded out the whole time. I enjoyed the blue milk uh, we did. And so that brings us to the nerd out moments of the day. So I didn't mention the um, uh, first nerd out moment, which was the blue milk. So drinking it was a great experience. It's basically a blueberry slushy, but even though it's not, uh, and they want you to pretend as blue milk, so there is that. And on a warm day, um, it is very refreshing. But the other thing that nerded me out the most was Oga's Cantina. So, of course, they would have a cantina in Galaxy's Edge. They would, it would kind of be a great oversight if they didn't have a cantina, whether it's um, exactly the one from from A New Hope, which I want to say they kind of did because if you look at the um, cantina in A New Hope, Olga's Cantina is kind of the same thing where you have the, a U shape of the bar and then you have um, 
tables and seats built and standing areas built around it for various people to enjoy their drinks and snacks and things like that. So my friend and I did go to the cantina. I had a, a glass of the Gamorian Ale. He had uh, another um, one of their beers. So very refreshing, very tasty. Um, and very relaxing. I mean, it's a very nice experience and good to get out of the heat for a little bit. Enjoy another refreshing beverage. Um, and generally just dig the vibes of the cantina. Um, the music that they had playing with uh, DJ Rex, I want to say it was. I forget the droid's name offhand, but the playlist was alright. I did like the kind of more upbeat, bassy, EDM version of the cantina band from a new hope so i guess that and that's another thing is to have that nice little bit of touch there but in general just hanging out in a, a star wars themed cantina was a good time um going there a bit of forewarning is that they do have a 45 minute limit on um attending the bar so once you're there um you do have 45 minutes to enjoy a, a maximum of two beverages per person they do let you know that once you walk away from your wherever they um, let you enjoy your beverages, then they will replace your spot very quickly. So they basically say don't leave your spot until you've finished um, all of your drinks that you're going to have. And then you can walk around and explore the bar after that. But depending on where you're at, I mean, for the most part, you can enjoy the bar, especially if you're in the standing area of the bar, or like one of the standing tables, is you can enjoy, enjoy the bar from almost any angle. So it's easy to get pictures and, and generally just have a good time and enjoy the vibe of the bar. So it was a good, I think we spent maybe a good 30 or 35 minutes. So we, we ordered, we were able to get in, we ordered the, our beer. So it took a few minutes and then we drank them. Just hung, hung out, talked talk to some of the other people there, and ha had a good time. Um, at the moment, they do advise you to make a reservation to get into the cantina. So basically, you'll install the Disney app um, before you go to the park. So you'll use that to also make your virtual boarding pass reservation for Rise of the Resistance. So while you have it installed, you might as well make a reservation for the cantina. Um, and, then you, and then they'll notify you once your time is ready to go. So it's about a 30 or for us it was about a 30 minute wait we went in the afternoon so um we can enjoy the beers as well um although i mean there's nothing against having a beer in the morning i want to assume that they have alcohol in the morning but it's one of those things where it didn't also feel right but in any case um that was the planning we so we showed up and we got in line They're like oh you have to make the reservation and come back so we made the reservation and we spent some more time walking around Galaxy's Edge. We checked out um, Kylo Ren and his Stormtroopers, um, their little interactions with the guest, uh, more time spent in the just browsing the shops and stuff and stuff like that. And then once they notified us, they um, we spent some time there as well. So that was really the bulk of the day. And then we left the park in the evening after the fireworks. Uh, we were um, going to just watch it from in front of the castle, but... We asked one of the cast members um, where the various points to view the fireworks for, for, are from, and she did advise that the two best places are in front of It's a Small World if you want to see the projections on the um, It's a Small World building, or you can see it from Galaxy's Edge above the Millennium Falcon, so you can kind of get that fireworks over that. You're going to miss the music and the show and all of that, but if you want to just check out the fireworks, that's another good place. So we actually viewed the fireworks from Galaxy's Edge next to the Millennium Falcon. So um, the final video in the YouTube playlist is that fireworks show. It lasts about 10 or 11 minutes. And if you think of, you know, the celebrations at the end of Return of the Jedi or... At, at the end of a phantom uh, a phantom Men or the phantom menace then that's kind of the look and feel you get because you're in galaxy's edge star wars land fireworks and all of that so the a pseudo bit of nerding out not as much as the blue milk or the cantina but it was good to view the fireworks from there so that's all there is for this particular um review and recap so a uh, fun filled set of a couple of days um at the theme parks, um, so while Knott's Berry Farm is having their 100 year anniversary, so that's a good time to still try out their boysenberry themed events, check out some of their decorations and all the blueberries that they have 
or some poison berries that they have lying around the park. The rides are good. I would recommend, so granted, so as of this recording, school is also starting, so the attendance should be pretty low and it should be pretty easy to get on most of the rides. But if not, I would recommend um, trying out their fast lane pass. So if you're thinking, wondering why Knott's Berry Farm tickets are relatively cheap, so I think they were about $55 or $59 a piece. If you buy them online, they're I think 80 or like $79 or $89 if you buy them at the park. Um, so if you buy them online, they're actually, uh, like I said, $59 or $99 or $59 or $55 online. So a lot cheaper than Disneyland, but that also does not get you the fast lane access. And granted, right now, um, because of COVID, Disneyland also does not have their fast lane system going on. Um, but if you do buy the fast lane pass, it's $89 online for knots and $99 at the park. So with the um, online ticket and the online fast lane pass, it is actually comparable to a Disneyland ticket, which for us was $145. So um, the benefit of getting the fast lane pass or going to Knott's Berry Farm is that you still do get the fast lane access. So I would recommend go buying both um, because it's a, a comparable price for both parks. But if you're going on a weekend when Knott's Berry Farm and Disneyland are generally busier, then having the fast lane pass will guarantee you the ability to get onto all the big rides really quickly. So uh, Ghost Rider, um, Silver Bullet, Montezuma's Revenge, and um, Jaguar, also, uh, sorry, also um, Accelerator all have fast lane uh, lines. So it basically allows you to get on the rides within, I want to say about, at most, I want to say maybe 20 or 30 minutes. So that'll allow you to enjoy the rest of the park and enjoy the food, go on, you know, the Calico Mine Ride, which I think also has a fast lane pass. Uh, you can go on the train, you can enjoy shows and have a more relaxing time by also being able to grab lunch and spend some time going around the park and doing various other things or even going on rides multiple times. Um, so for example, the last time I went to the to Knott's Berry Farm a couple years ago, the line for hang time was, I want to say, an hour and a half. Accelerator was an hour and a half to two hours. I think not, uh, Ghost Rider was closed, but then like the line for the Calico Mine Ride was a good hour. The train was maybe 45 minutes to an hour. So think you know, basically, you know, on a regular busy day where the lines are an hour a piece and you want to go on, you know, six or seven rides, that's the bulk of your day. Um, so it's a bummer that uh, Disneyland doesn't have the fast lane pass at the moment, but the benefit of, that we had with school starting and sad to say with COVID is that what Disneyland did with their line queue, line queue system was very um, different and unique to the point where wherever they have double lines going on for the rides, they actually made it a single longer line, but the, for some reason the lines were moving really quickly. So. Like I said, I think the longest wait time we had was like 30 or 35 minutes. Most other rides were like 5 to 15 minutes, so we were on pretty quickly. So I want to say the attendance was pretty low for the day. But um, also, their queuing system seems they've kind of gone around, gotten around the fast lane pass by um, making the lines feel like they're moving a lot faster. So in general, it was a good time just because we weren't spending too much time waiting to get on any of the rides. Um, so that's all there is for this particular recap. So um, for the public post on the sh um, of this episode, there will be a link in the show notes to the YouTube playlist. So there's a series of videos I took th um, during the day of both um, parks where you'll get walk walkthrough videos um, of Ghost Town, board the Boardwalk and Fiesta Village at Berry Farm. Uh, random shots of rides and various things um, at the park. Um, I want to say that Nosbury Farm is actually the easier park to photograph and take videos of um, compared to Disneyland. Disneyland didn't feel like I had too many opportunities to take videos, so I did take a quick video of Main Street um, and through Galaxy's Edge and of um, Jungle Cruise, but the rest of the park is kind of weird to photograph. It's more out in the open, so I don't know, it was just strange. I found Knott's Berry Farm easier to take videos at, but um, 
the po- the show notes for the episode will have the full episode guide along with the link to the video playlist so you can check out the video experience at the day but if you're a patron of the the uh, headphones you know, reviews then you also get a separate playlist um, for patrons uh, with the back end um, updates and planning that went into the preparation of um, the hardware you use, the video recording, the filters, um, the audio and stuff like that. So it was a bummer that the audio wasn't as good as I hoped while I was at the park. It was pretty loud and then talking through a map, or sorry, map, not map, but mask was kind of strange. So one of those things where it kind of didn't work out as well as I hoped. So this podcast is the more definitive um, guide for that, but um, patrons get a special playlist in the show notes uh, or the episode guide to check out the backend planning that went into the apps used, the devices used, the recording, the planning, and all of that stuff. So if you're interested in getting all of that backend stuff and that backend playlist, then you can check that out and become a supporter of the show on Patreon at patreon.com slash pateln01. And of course, if you can subscribe and get access, get all the prior episodes and all the various support options and all of that good stuff on the website at headphonesneal.reviews, um, you can check out this post, comment, provide your feedback, stuff I missed, didn't miss, stuff you liked, like at Knott's Berry Farm and Disneyland, dislike, your thoughts and feedback and all of that on Twitter at PatelN01. But thanks for tuning in to this particularly long and event-filled uh, podcast episode, and until next time.